Hello, my name is John Considine. I teach English at the University of Alberta in Canada. Today I'm going to talk for 15 minutes or so about syntax. This talk is particularly directed at my students in the class English 212, Introduction to the English Language. If you are one of those students, then well done. You've come to the right broadcast. This is number one of the three broadcasts which are going to substitute for our class on Thursday the 8th of March when I'm going to be out of town. If you're not one of my students, that's good too. Syntax is an important and beautiful subject. I have a lovely British accent. You're going to learn about a very central part of human life in an extremely pleasurable and life-enhancing way. Let me begin. All I want to do in this broadcast is to say what syntax is, how it fits into the story that we've been telling about the English language in this course ever since January, and what one or two of the central ideas, the central terms that, that we use in the study of syntax are. Since January, We've been thinking about the way that natural human languages, like English, make, to coin a phrase, infinite use of finite resources. The finite resources with which English starts are speech sounds, and we spent two weeks thinking about how we make those speech sounds, and thinking about how they build up into a phonological inventory of about 24 distinctive consonants and about 12 distinctive vowels. This phonological inventory is the foundation of, of all of spoken English. Those vowels and consonants build up, following the phonological rules of English, into syllables. There are rules for how they can combine with each other to make a syllable and how they can't. Once we're looking at syllables, we see that some syllables do actually mean things. Mean, for instance, or thing. Sometimes a combination of two or three syllables means a single thing. Meaningful syllables, or sequences of syllables, can be built up into words. And looking at how that happens is, is the topic of morphology which we covered after we'd looked at phonetics and phonology. Last week, we got as far as thinking about how words do different jobs in sentences. We can classify words depending on the kind of job that they do, the kind of position that they can occupy in a sentence. There are about 36 Phonemes in the phonological inventory of English, I suppose there must be one or two thousand syllables used in English. There's something between half a million and two million words in the English language, depending on how you want to define a word. But the way that the English language is actually infinite, how it actually makes infinite use of finite means, depends on syntax. Those half million or million or two million words can be combined and recombined in an infinite number of sequences, and that truly is an infinite number. It's a syntax that makes that combination happen, or you could say syntax is the discipline in which we describe that combination. Syntax means putting things together. A synagogue is a place where people come together for worship. A symposium, notice that it's symposium with an M, which assimilates to the P after it. Um, a symposium is when you get together with people to drink. Synchronic analysis is the analysis of all the elements of a language together at one single time. Syntax has the same sense of togetherness. The tax bit comes from the same Greek root as taxonomy, a set of rules for classifying, for putting in order, or tactics, the science of ordering soldiers on a battlefield. So syntax 
is the way these words are ordered together, the way these words go together to make sentences. As soon as we talk about words being ordered together, we're getting to the heart of something that makes syntax human. All human languages have some rules about how elements can be put together to build up bigger utterances. This is something that human children learn as a very, very early stage in their language acquisition. They learn the way that things are named, the way that they can talk about things by putting words together, and they learn the basic rules for ordering words. Something striking about some of the non-human experimental subjects who have been taught the elements of human language is that they really tend not to be very good at syntax. There's a famous utterance by Nim Chimsky, I think, certainly one of the primates who was, was taught some um, elements of, of, of human language. Nim wanted an orange, and he said something like, give, give, give me orange, orange, give, give me, give, give. That's a nice string of elements, but it's not an ordered string. It's not a syntactically ordered string. Nim didn't have syntax. Humans do have syntax. In the next of these broadcasts, we'll actually be thinking about the work of Noam Chomsky, who, whose name was borrowed for the um, experimental primate Nim Chomsky. We'll be thinking about the work of Noam Chomsky, who's very interested in the fundamental place of uh, the syntactic ability in, in, in humans. What gets ordered in syntax? It isn't actually just words. Rather than stringing individual words together in sentences, we build sentences up out of smaller units, out of so-called constituents. And on page 167 of Curzon and Adams's textbook, um, we're, we're, we're told that constituents and hierarchies is a fundamental concept in syntax. It's because we build sentences up out of constituents that we can think about so-called garden path sentences, sentences that lead you in one direction and then turn out to mean something else of the sort which Curzon and Adams present at the very beginning of chapter 6. In a sentence like, the horse raced past the barn fell, as we listen to that sentence, as we try to make sense of it, we try to group the words together into a meaningful set, into a meaningful constituent of the unit, a, a meaningful constituent of the sentence. We see the horse raced past the barn, and we say, aha, this looks familiar. The horse, determiner and noun, raced, that's what it did, past the barn, that's how it raced. And then we actually get to the word fell, and we say, this doesn't make sense as a sentence. And we go back and figure out that it must mean the horse raced past the barn, the horse which had been raced past the barn, fell. That the basic sentence is the horse fell and raced past the barn is a phrase dropped in um, after the subject of the sentence to describe the subject. When we make that sort of sense of subjects, we're making sense of the sentence. When we're making that sort of sense of sentences, we're making sense of the sentence in terms of its constituents. What are those constituents? We can look at the constituents of a sentence at four levels. First, there's the basic word, the, horse, raced, and so on. Words build up into phrases. Do you remember when we were looking at that 
make-believe sentence, the sentence with all those invented words made up by Lord Quirk. Plome the pleak for Croatian will be ruggling Polanians unglesherably in the writ. We could see, even without the help of punctuation, that some of those words fit together in little groups. We could see that in the writ made sense as a group. We could see that the pleak for Croatian made sense as a group will be ruggling made sense as a group. We weren't just decoding that sentence word by word. We were decoding it phrase by phrase. Phrase is a slightly vague expression. You could say that any group of words which hangs together is a phrase. And at this point I hope there aren't expert syntacticians listening to this broadcast. They could doubtless um, define phrase in a much more sophisticated way. A group of words that hangs together will do fine for me. Does fine for me. Phrases can be fitted together into clauses. And clause does have a somewhat more precise definition than phrase. A clause has to have a verb in it. There are some clauses which can stand by themselves as sentences. The horse fell. There are other clauses which can't stand by themselves as sentences. Because it had eaten too many oats before it started running, or whatever. Yet that clause, which begins because is what we call a subordinate clause in the, in the trade. You may remember that when we were talking about the lexical categories of words last week, we did very quickly glance at subordinating conjunctions, the sorts of conjunctions, like because, which characteristically begin subordinate clauses. Clauses can stand by themselves as sentences. They can be subordinate elements of sentences, they can be combined to make quite big, complex sentences. You could join two clauses together, for instance, with a coordinating conjunction like and. The horse fell, and its owner was gravely distressed. You can join clauses together, join a, 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 an independent and a subordinate clause together, to make a, a complex sentence. The horse fell because it had eaten so many oats before it began running. You could even have a sentence which um, is, is both compound and complex. The horse fell because it had eaten so many oats when it began running, and its owner was extremely distressed. What we're seeing here, and we'll look at this more carefully in the second of these broadcasts, is the way that constituents get embedded into a sentence. And one of the reasons why there's an infinite number of possible sentences in a language like English, and in all or nearly all human languages, is that one of the elements that can be embedded into an English sentence is another sentence. Curzon and Adams wrote a textbook. That's a sentence. I know that Curzon and Adams wrote a, a textbook. That's another sentence with a whole sentence embedded in it. You know that I know that Curzon and Adams wrote a textbook. That's another sentence which has a sentence embedded in it, which has a sentence embedded in it. We can go on doing this sort of embedding forever or at least and, and, until we, we, we all die of boredom or die of old age. That's why we speak of English as having a potentially infinite number of sentences in it. I guess you could also string sentences together to form new sentences of infinite length with coordinating conjunctions, but you can most obviously form sentences of infinite length by embedding sentences in sentences. This is the property of language called recursion. It seems to be more or less a universal property of languages, although Curzon and Adams point out that one language of the Amazonian um, jungle, um, called Piraha, appears not to have recursion, 
I suspect that just means that speakers of Piraha don't do recursion when there are um, linguistic anthropologists around. Maybe they have a taboo about doing recursion when there are strangers listening. Be that as it may, the great majority of human languages have recursion and can therefore form infinitely long sentences. English has recursion and can therefore form infinitely long sentences. It's when we look at syntax, and particularly at the remarkable syntactic property of recursion, that we see the full sense of the claim with which we started, that English, like other natural human languages, really does make infinite use of finite resources. What we'll do in the second of these three broadcasts is look in a fairly non-technical, fairly superficial way at some of the material in Kurzad Adams's chapter 6 which shows us how sentences work and gives us a way of making diagrams to show how sentences work. We'll talk a bit about the project of generative grammar and indeed the subsequent project of transformational generative grammar. Again, we're not going to do this in any technical depth. I'm not a syntactician, but we'll get a sense of what's going on in that part of the chapter. Then, in the third broadcast, we'll think about some syntactic issues from a prescriptive, descriptive point of view. That's the material at the end of Curzon and Adams' chapter 6. So, Make yourself a nice cup of tea, come back, listen to broadcast two. Thank you very much for listening to this one. That's all for now.